What wonderful and inspiring words from Jayathma. Welcome back to our, all of our wonderful attendees today. I hope you've been enjoying the conversations as much as I have been. For our last session today, we're talking, we're taking some of the realities facing young Asia engaged people we discussed in panel one and explore and are exploring the how. Now we know what this new world is, how do we navigate these new parameters to engage with Asia? Joining us for this second panel are leaders from some of the most active youth organisations engaging with the region to talk best practice, digital setup, creating meaningful connection and the value of personal connection in empowering the next generation to become Asia passionate in the months and years ahead. So to introduce our panel, all the way from Jakarta in Indonesia, we have Clarice Campbell, who is the National President of the Australia Indonesia Youth Association. From Canberra, we have Cameron Allen, CEO of the ASEAN Australia Strategic Youth Partnership. And in Melbourne, we are joined by Deborah Jang, National President of the Australia China Youth Association, and Kanako Marais, oh, sorry, Marais, Marise, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Australia Japan Youth Dialogue Steering Committee member and AGYD 2019 delegate. Be sure to read our speakers' full and very impressive bios by clicking the speakers on the platform platform page and click on their headshot. Panelists, welcome all for joining us. So to dive right into the questions, Clarice, you're joining us from lockdown in Jakarta. Indonesia is currently the world's um, COVID epicenter. Firstly, how are you doing? And secondly, how important in times like this is digital connection in the absence of face-to-face -face interaction? And what does that mean for your member base, particularly at this time? Hey Mercedes, and thank you so much Asian Society for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm doing okay, uh, obviously not the best uh, situation to be in. Um, and yes, Indonesia is kind of experiencing a surge of, of COVID cases at the moment. Luckily, we're kind of in a downward trend, um, but our downward trend is very different to the Australian situation. We're still at about 30,000 cases a day. Um, so for those of you in Australia, I do, you know, get lots of worried messages from friends and families asking if I'm okay and that sort of thing. Um, because the situation here is pretty dire and the, um, you know, kind of peak that we experienced a couple of weeks ago now, you know, we were seeing close to about 60,000 cases a day. Um, and of course, the real situation here in Indonesia is much more actually dire than that because the actual tests that are conducted here in Indonesia aren't showing the real reality of what's happening on the ground because uh, we don't have the privilege to get free testing. Everybody has to pay for tests. And actually paying for those tests is really actually prohibitive for a lot of people because it's just too expensive for them. So there is a reluctance to actually go and get tested in the first place. And that's just um, a kind of aspect that we have to consider in this uh, Indonesian situation. But you asked about you know, face-to-face uh, -face interaction and, and how it is to kind of um, connect digitally considering the situation that we're, we're in. And for AYA, it's, it's really important because naturally for our chapters, particularly in Indonesia, we just haven't been able to have any face-to-face -face, um, events during the entire pandemic. Um, it was a real shame for us to kind of make the call that we had to sort of cancel our face-to-face -face events when we realised that uh, the pandemic was sort of growing in size when this all started. And um, it's pretty much going to be like this probably for some time for us here in Indonesia. So, of course, we had to transition our sort of face-to-face -face engagement to be completely digital. Um, I think our organisation has done a really good job in doing this. Um, our Indonesian chapters in particular are amazing at kind of adapting to this situation, even though they may have personally been affected um, and, you know, people are in, you know, less than ideal sort of circumstances. But they've done a wonderful job. And for us, we were really worried that um, not having that kind of opportunity for face-to-face -face engagement would see a reduction in, in, say, our membership numbers or people attending events and that sort of thing. But in reality, we've actually seen an increase in participation um, across events throughout the organisation. And that's actually kind of um, being reflected also in our membership numbers. If we compare our membership data, you know, from the start of 2020 to what it is now, we've actually seen about a 30% increase in members, um, even though we haven't been able to have a lot of um, in-person events, which is generally a lot of the kind of the draw card for us. So overall, um, we've done 
pretty well um, considering the circumstances and we're, you know, just kind of considering well, what is our strategy going forward, just acknowledging that um, this pandemic won't be ending for us, especially here in Indonesia, probably anytime soon. Um, and so how are we going to continue to create really uh, engaging digital events to ensure that we still maintain that growth in members um, and engagement within our chapters? So that's just um, how we've been able to adapt. Um, of course, we would love to have, you know, in-person events as soon as possible. And our Australian chapters, uh, where they're able to do so, have started to have, you know, hybrid events where they have, you know, a physical event, say in Brisbane, but then they have, you know, an online component to that so that there's more engagement. And that's actually made our events probably more inclusive because people who are not physically based in that city can also attend that event. So that's a really good um, element of engagement for us. So obviously not ideal in some aspects, but we're still growing and we're still adapting. Um, so digital connection is very important for us. Thank you, Clarice. And it's um, really, um, I guess, heartening to hear the positives of um, how, how you've been able to adapt. Um, and I hope you're keeping safe in very tragic and dire circumstances. So my next question is to Cameron. So as ACIP is a multilateral youth dialogue, how important is agility, flexibility and innovation when it comes to connecting hundreds and hundreds of members across many different countries in the region? And how has digital always been part of ACIP's remit? And can you speak to some of your digital successes or victories of late? Yeah, cheers. No problem, Mercedes. Um, hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. My name's Cameron. I'm calling from Ngunnawal land or Canberra um, and four hours until we go into lockdown. So um, definitely, um, yeah, look, that's <laughs> a bit of a change of pace uh, for the weekend. Um, it's good to hear that you're going well, Clarice. Um, all of us on this call work quite closely together across different projects. And I think one of the beauties of these uh, diplomacy organizations is that you have an awareness of what's happening overseas. So you're constantly uh, sort of have some gratitude in the back of your mind about the um, circumstances that we're experiencing in Australia. So glad to hear you're going well, Clarice. Um, so for those of you who don't know um, much about ASIP, essentially what we do is we um, bridge connections between young people in Southeast Asia and Australia. Uh, and we do that using sort of three key pillars. We try to build capability, inspire engagement and create connections. So how I like to explain that is we try to put the real relationships in international relations. So to get to the heart of our Mercedes question, uh, I think ASIP was born as a digital entity. So as Clarice was saying, a lot of the events that we typically would do at ASIP would be in person, but we have always had a very strong digital element. Um, ASIP only started two and a half years ago, and that founding team was spread across Australia and Southeast Asia. Um, and I can remember quite fondly, like hot spotting from my small costs uh, in Jogjakarta as I tried to, to call the rest of the team. So in that sense, we've always been online. Um, and I suppose the reasons for that are very practical. Um, we don't have funding to fly across the region for meetings. We don't have the time for that, nor is that the ecologically a uh, sound thing to do. So um, I suppose we were Zooming before it was cool. Uh, and I suppose that put us in a pretty good spot when um, we were forced to move online at the start of last year. Um, Mercedes, I, the, the three words I think you mentioned were agility, flexibility, and innovation. Um, what do those words mean for ASIP in a digital context? Um, I would say that all three of those things are very important, um, but I think the most valuable ingredient we've found over the last 18 months is innovation. Um, and I think innovation is important because as everyone has done across the world over the last 18 months, we've really had to abandon old ways of thinking, old types of programs uh, and focus on how we can move those things online or create new things online. Um, and I think it's, you know, people quite generally focus on um, the negatives of that and it, it was very challenging, but I do think there was a lot of um, positives for our organization. Um, I think it really disrupted our inertia and it really served as an impetus for us to really think about our organization and really think about our impact 
and which activities uh, give value to our members. Um, but I think something to keep in mind uh, is that innovation and being innovative is not just something that magically happens. Um, I think we have a tendency to frame imagination as something that's very individual and momentary and elusive, something that, you know, an idea pops into your head and then you pursue it. Um, but rather, I try like to think about innovation as something that is actively practiced um, and that you should structure your organization in certain ways to enable and uh, stimulate innovation. So just three really quick things that um, perhaps our audience can take away today. What are three things that I think have enabled innovation at ASIP uh, in the digital context? I think firstly, a culture of vulnerability. Um, so in our ASIP value statement, our number one value is have the courage to be vulnerable. And I think that's very, very important because if people feel comfortable to be vulnerable and to share their feedback frankly with each other, then you're way more likely to get people's ideas and to share and to, to have a continuous improvement culture. So I think practicing vulnerable leadership is really important. Secondly, governance is really important. Um, you know, we've moved to having an independent board model separate from our operational team. And that gives us the capacity to think big picture about things whilst the operational team are focused on the day-to-day -day delivery. So I think that helps us with our risk management and to come up with new ideas. And finally, I think being inspired and connected to the ecosystem is really important. So we have a broad spectrum of partners at ASIP. We consult them very regularly. Um, and those you know, partners have different expertises in different areas. So we might consult people for our modern slavery programs, or we might consult different people for our international education programs. And those people keep us constantly inspired. Um, so my re strong recommendation is having a really diverse network of partners you talk to regularly because they will keep you innovative. Um, yeah, and I suppose I might just leave it there, but um, I would say that the moving online, we've, we've adopted a bunch of new programs. Um, for example, our Break the Chain Modern Slavery Program, our Reset Region-Wide Problem Solving Challenge. All of these things um, have been incredibly impactful. Um, have drawn in new members uh, and have really allowed us to amplify our digital footprint. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, Cam. Like, that's really fantastic. And I think there are some really strong lessons in there that are applicable for organizations of any type, not just youth dialogues. Um, my next question is to Kanako. So AGYD's third Australia-Japan Youth Dialogue will be held in a hybrid online and in-person format in November, which is really exciting. So Japan has a lot of eyes on it this year with the recently concluded Olympics, um, the Paralympics and the upcoming general election. What themes are you hoping to explore at the dialogue and how is your network responding to a hybrid model of engagement? Thanks, Mercedes. Um, great question. So this year's dialogue is going to be held, as you mentioned, in November this year, and application just opened yesterday. So please um, feel free to check our website and please keep an eye on our social because our official launch will be next Monday. And But in the meantime, please feel free to check our website and have a bit of sneak peek for this year's dialogue. And we, we our, one of our core value is diversity. So we really trying to maximize the relevance of this year's dialogue discussion and outcomes to a variety of sectors. And especially we, uh, this year, we're trying to design a program which is relevant, very relevant to this year's delegates. So in application I mentioned earlier, we include a question to ask themes and speakers they would like to see in the dialogue. So we really trying to um, design and incorporate the delegates idea into this year's program. And this year's hybrid model will be very interesting because we, it, it gives us a lot of flexibility and we have less constraints in time and um, location. So we might even be able to tap into a potential pool of speakers, which we normally wouldn't have be able to approach. So the, the speakers don't necessarily need to be in a host city, physically available in host city, like uh, traditional dialogue. They could be anywhere in the world. So uh, it'd be really interesting to um, have a more diverse variety of speakers this year. And as you quickly mentioned, Japan is expecting a few domestic changes. 
Uh, general election is going to happen in October, and LV, LDP's presidential election is expected to happen next month, which the result is pretty much expected. But um, it will be interesting to see how these changes might affect our bilateral relationship. And um, there's a strong interest around quad and hydrogen and that sort of area, which we would um, like to explore. And the Olympics has had been attracting a lot of controversy, anxiety, and excitement as well. And November Starlog would be an excellent opportunity to reflect the Olympics and also compare that with the upcoming Winter Olympics in Beijing early next year and how they will use the opportunity um, diplomatically, politically, to emphasize the difference with the Tokyo Olympics and show their capabilities will be another interesting area to explore. And of course, in November, COVID will be still affect, affecting both Australia and Japan. So um, it'd be interesting to explore. I think it's quite similar to the theme of this um, today's Asia Societies event, but it'd be interesting to explore how industries thrive during 2020 during COVID and how um, new opportunity emerged throughout the pandemic would be another interesting area to explore. So these are the themes and what we are trying to achieve by the making most of our hybrid model. So please check on our socials on next Monday. And in the meantime, feel free to check our website for this year's uh, dialogue application. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's a bit of an understatement to say that there's um, lots of topics to discuss at the, the dialogue. Um, it seems like, um, yeah, um, I, yeah, I'm sure you could um, host a dialogue that lasted a full week and still have plenty still to discuss. So best of luck um, in your organizational arrangements um, in the lead up to November. But um, I just wanted to um, ask a bit of a follow up question, but direct it to Deborah. So regarding in-person versus offline connection, can you share a bit of your recent experience with the Australia-China Emerging Leaders um, Symposium? Thanks so much, Mercedes. And yeah, of course, more than happy to. So Akia's flagship initiative is known as the Australia-China Emerging Leaders Summit or ACELs a little bit more colloquially. And I'm sure that there are hopefully many members in the audience today who have been a previous delegate to ACELs. What's previously been the attraction of ACELs is that it's been held in either a Chinese host city or an Australian host city. So not only is it a fantastic opportunity for delegates to meet each other, engage in personal development and professional development and meet industry leaders, it's been a really, really important opportunity for them to actually get to travel, to experience a new culture and experience things like the food and the tourist attractions. So given that things were improving slightly with COVID this year, we made the decision to host the 13th iteration of our summit in our very first hybrid model. So we had the two host cities of Adelaide and Chengdu with the idea that they would be connected for workshops and panels via video link. Everything was going all well up and good until about three weeks out from the summit, when as many Australians know, we had another outbreak based in New South Wales and then all our planning sort of had to scramble and reevaluate. And we had to make the very difficult decision to make our Australian delegates um, and uh, I guess participate in the conference as e-delegates. Um, but we were able to host face-to-face -face dinners um, in different states to facilitate that in-person connection. Uh, regardless of the last minute changes and the disappointment that we weren't able to go to Adelaide Zoo to see the pandas or go to the Barossa Valley or have all that in-person connection, it was still incredibly heartening to see the resilience of our Australian delegates and their continued desire to engage in dialogue regarding the Australia-China relationship, even if in an online format. And it was also fantastic to see an in-person event in China after everything that's happened over the past 18 months, if not a little bit envy inducing for everyone in Australia. Thank you so much. Um, we spoke earlier today, Henry, uh, Deborah, with Henry from the Australia China Young Prof Professionals Initiative around the, um, the nature of the Australia China relationship currently. So I wanted to ask you, is the Australia China Youth Association losing reach or interest or membership number or seeing a decline in membership numbers? 
And what are the, some of the longer term risks um, of losing Asia engaged young people at this time? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so the Australia in the Eyes of the Chinese poll, which was released today by the Beijing Foreign Studies University, indicates that under 30s in China have proved to be the most welcoming age group towards Australia. And this has very much been indicated in the growth of Akia over the past 18 months. For those who aren't aware, our target age demographic is aged 18 to 30. So in spite of all the geopolitical conflicts and international border closures, it's been extremely encouraging to see our chapters in places like Chengdu and Guangzhou be revitalised, as well as interest in new chapters in the Northern Territory, Tasmania, Victoria and Xiamen. So through chapter activities and events such as ACELs, we've been able to see that young people are optimistic and do have an interest in maintaining people to people connections across the bilateral relationship. That being said, the incentive for many young people to become Asia engaged for a long time has been trouble. And this has been the case for me personally and for many members at Akia. So whether that's something like a short term overseas subject or a year abroad in Singapore or Japan or Indonesia, then doing things like learning language and learning about politics and history from your bedroom just isn't the same. It's just not comparable to being able to be in a classroom in Shanghai or Jakarta. I think one of the risks there then is that we potentially have a generation of three to four years of university students, young professionals who aren't engaged in the Asia region and they aren't, you know, forming those people to people connections. They aren't gaining knowledge. And that has some really detrimental effects in the long run. I think in the long run, that looks like potentially a lack of willingness to engage with Asia in 10, 15 years when the relationship might be repaired. And I think this time where we are all, all online and we are able to connect, as Cam mentioned, and be innovative, I think now is a really great time to grasp what digital engagement can offer us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I think that really leads quite nicely into um, the next question, which is for Clarice. So around the current take up of Indonesian studies at Australian universities and how um, AIYA is working to boost Indonesian interest amongst young people. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I think most people are probably aware of the situation in Australia where several universities have kind of indicated that they're either cutting their Indonesian studies department or reducing the capacity to focus on research related to Indonesia. Um, and it's, you know, a real shame from AYA's perspective because uh, our Australian sort of cohort of members largely comes from uh, those students who have studied Indonesia at a tertiary level. So this is an area of concern for us because, you know, we don't like to hear um, that any university is um, cutting the, these areas of study. Uh, we want as many universities in Australia to be focusing on Indonesia and have an interest in Indonesia and engage with Indonesia as much as possible. Um, we don't really know actually what the number of students is um, in the sort of 2020-2021 period because those statistics actually are not yet available. They will be available later in the year. So we're going to be paying really close attention to that because it kind of indicates to us uh, what the pool of Australians is to engage with. Ways that AYA can, I guess, make impact in this area though, is by actually assisting um, those Indonesian studies students, either at a high school level or university level, in accessing resources to assist them with their Indonesian language studies. It's very hard for us to sort of, you know, hear that a university is sort of cutting a course and then try to sort of lobby that university to you know, change their decision because these decisions are sort of made at a really, you know, high level and, and it's really tough for a university actually to kind of make that call as well. Um, so, you know, we're not able to sort of swoop in and say, oh, we will save this area of study. Uh, we have funding to do that or anything like that. You know, we're a small not-for-profit youth association. So we do have to be realistic with what we can actually do to kind of impact this area. The ways that AYA has essentially attempted to assist this is um, we have been uh, having conversations with a lot of high school teachers who are obviously worried about you know not only uh, conducting their uh, courses within their high schools but then encouraging their students to go on and study at a university level and they're saying they don't have enough resources um, it's very hard for them to kind of bring a lot of resources together there's not sort of one location where you can access indonesian studies resources 
So ways that I can help is obviously we have a very large number of Indonesian students and uh, you know Indonesians who are based here in Indonesia who are actually really willing and able to assist uh, with, with these sorts of requests. We have a blog that we uh, write and produce content on you know, weekly. And so actually using that content, which is produced by native speakers for schools that they can use to assist um, their high school students to you know, find that love of Indonesia and to actually then engage with our, with our members. That is one way that we have tried to support uh, young Australians in their sort of journey of loving and learning Indonesian. So that is one area. We of course also have a what we call flexible language exchange program in various uh, chapters across Australia in particular. We have traditionally had what we call just language exchange where we would have a sort of weekly or bi-weekly session that uh, anyone of any uh, you know, language learning level could come in and they could meet you know, people in their community and they can converse and you know, it's an easy and fun way for them to improve their Indonesian skills with various lockdowns and um, restrictions around uh, numbers of, of people being able to gather. You know, we've had to think of creative ways to, to get around this. So uh, we call we created Flexible Language Exchange, which is just an online version of that. And we use a platform called Discord, which is like a really fun, um, you know, kind of interactive, uh, you know, very hip young person sort of, sort of platform. And we encourage people to come to that. We host it at least uh, twice a month, but we also have more informal sessions that people can come on. So if you're a learner of Indonesian and you are thinking, I don't know where to practice my Indonesian, I don't know any Indonesians in Australia, how do I engage with the community? This is how you engage uh, during you know, pandemic times. So we offer that as, a, as a, an offering for our membership. Um, and the Discord link is just basically sent out to our members and there, you know, you can jump onto that basically at any time. So those are some of kind of like the tangible ways that Aya has been thinking about in terms of actually being able to help this situation uh, because the university is obviously in a really kind of uh, tough situation in terms of making these choices. But it's something we're following very closely. We're also, you know, we're consulting with all of the universities for having these conversations to ask them, you know, how can we support support them in, in the struggles of, of making these decisions and obviously just trying to encourage them as much as possible to, to reconsider any cuts or restructuring to the various departments that, that house Indonesian studies. But it's absolutely a concern um, and we just want to see as many people, you know, fall in love with Indonesia as we all have uh, because it's a really important um, country for us to be engaging with. and. Uh, with very few Australians who have, you know, proficiency in Indonesia, uh, like, you know, it's going to be a, a struggle for our country's future if we don't have that. Absolutely. And I just wanted to qu quickly just pick up on um, something that you said around, you know, the, rea the realities around, you know, the inability to travel and the impact that has on um, you know, generating or helping cement interest in Asia. But I wanted to direct that to Cameron. So how much do you think an inability to travel has affected young people's interest in pursuing Asian studies or a career in Asia? Or, you know, is it too early to, to really tell? Thanks for the question, Mercedes. I'll be brief. Um, obviously, our inability to travel is affecting how we engage with the region. We just have way less planes of students and and young professionals going over to the region to to learn so that's like the the practical implications of that are clear but i i'm always cautious to frame our engagement with asia as a COVID issue because um our issues engaging with southeast asia um have been troubled for a while um recalling some of the key points that clarice made um, language capability in Australia is incredibly low. Um, as Chloe said, like um, institutions in the face of budget cuts are having to cut back on Asian studies programming. Um, and as Deb said, all of these things, language capability, institutional programs, all of these things build the pipeline of our future leaders uh, engaging with the region. So the question becomes, you know, in the absence of travel, how can we build that pipeline? How do we keep people engaged? And I think there is a lot of cause for optimism. Um, for example, these youth organizations on these calls are 
providing very, very practical opportunities for young people to learn more about these countries. Similarly to, to what Clarice said, um, ASIP, we've been doing a lot of work online to create avenues for different types of people to learn and engage with Southeast Asia. So we have our podcast and our newly launching TV show, which is all about highlighting youth perspectives in the region. Um, we run capability focused workshops through our digital events. Um, for example, how to write a CV if you want to apply for a job in Southeast Asia. All of these very practical programs are ways that we're helping build that pipeline. Um, so I am optimistic because the work is being done. You've just got to put your, you know, th throw your hat into the ring. Um, I think something that made me incredibly excited was last year, I sit with the three other organizations on this call. We ran the Indo-Pacific Student Mobility Youth Dialogue. And I think what that affirmed is that with the 160 delegates that attended, that there is a huge interest amongst young people in the future of student mobility. Young people want to get back out into the region when they can. So um, I think there is a lot of optimism. Um, and yeah, young people are engaged in those international education conversations. But I think in terms of what can you do right now to, to, to keep engaged with the region, sign up as members to our organizations. There's lots of opportunities, but also the best thing you can do is enroll in a Southeast Asian studies course. It's to learn a language when you're on campus, uh, or albeit in, di attending campus digitally, have a chat to an international student from a Southeast Asian country, uh, or in any other country, um, that there's the type of really practical things you can do on a day to day basis to, to really nurture that relationship whilst, you know, travel is impossible. Thank you. Those are some really, really practical tips and ideas um, about what we can be doing in this current situation. Um, my next question is for Kanako. Could you please tell us about the value and reach of the Australia-Japan Youth Dialogues alumni network? Um, how important is maintaining a strong alumni network and what value does it serve for the broader Australia-Japan bilateral relationship? Thanks, Mercedes. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the purpose of AJYD is to stimulate a deeper collaborative discussions between the generation of leaders from Australia and Japan. So in that context, um, alumni engagement is one of the most valuable and tangible outcome of a dialogue, I would say. And our delegates include a variety of next generation leaders across the industries. And we also stay in touch with our past speakers of, as well. So together, our network of past delegates and speakers uh, have a variety of the most powerful and active voices in bilateral field, I would say. So um, it's very important. And I think, um, our engagement in alumni, we encourage everyone to um, engage virtually. And also, um, um, we, uh, our, one of our core value is diversity. So we bring the those professionals who are not directly uh, related to bilateral area in their daily job into our conversation. And that will give a uh, different perspectives into our bilateral discussion and make our discussion very meaningful. So by stimulating those um, alumni engagement, we we have a chance to share our opportunity and knowledge. And our, as our network grows, it will become more influential and powerful in the bilateral field. So invest, we invest a lot of time and effort to maintain our alumni engagement. Thank you so much. Um, Deborah, how do we get young Australians that are not already Asia engaged, interested in the region? I'd be really interested in hearing your perspectives. And I know that some of our panelists have already touched on that. Um, but what do you think that we could be doing? That's a fantastic question, Mercedes. Thank you for that. Um, as institutions, as organisations and as education providers, I think it's imperative that we develop a better understanding of how young people actually gain knowledge about Asia and what particularly piques their interest. So for a bit of context, I'm a graduate teacher by trade 
and I have a particular professional interest in developing Asian literacy amongst both educators and students. And a lot of the material that exists is, I'll be frank, pretty removed from the day-to-day -day lives of young people and at times quite dull. So textbooks and resources will focus on things like mountains in Mongolia and migration patterns, which whilst important, isn't particularly relevant or exciting to young students um, who are enrolled you know, in history and geography courses at secondary school. Obviously that improves once you get to university, but that actual deep level of engagement is contingent on you going out and enrolling in that Asian studies course, enrolling in that Indonesian language course, choosing to take Japanese as an elective. So I think what we can do from early on and what I really encourage um, policymakers and those working with the Australian curriculum to do is to really look at the Asia literacy curriculum and the Asia literacy priority in Australia and reevaluate what types of content we have and how young people are actually forming perceptions about Asia. From working in classrooms, I think there's a definite interest there. There are students who, you know, might come across K-pop on Twitter or they might have a particular interest in sustainability and might really benefit from learning about how that's tackled in Asia. I think it's about looking at how we can engage people from early on. So when they go to university, they can do things like Cam mentioned, you know, they can actually go out and enroll in that subject. They can take up that elective. They can strike up that conversation in the classroom and that sets them on a path to engage with the region long term. Thank you. Those are all fantastic um, ideas um, with really you know, tangible and practical um, outcomes. Um, I'm very conscious that we've only got four minutes um, remaining for our discussion and we haven't even touched on any of the, the audience Q&A that have been coming through. Um, but we have had one question, um, which I think is actually a really, really good one to wrap up on. And that question is, do you have any tips or recommendations for those who want to explore starting a similar bilateral youth organisation? And what have been some of your key learnings or challenges starting and growing your respective organisations? Um, so it'd be really, really great um, if each of our panellists wanted to um, very quickly answer that question or you're welcome to provide any other wrap up remarks that you would like. Just um, if you could keep it to around 60 seconds, that would be great. Um, maybe I could start with uh, Clarice. Sure, that's a really great question. And I think we have the answer, to be honest. Um, so uh, ACIP, AYA and APIA started what we call the Youth Diplomacy Community of Practice uh, in late 2020. And that was started actually because we realized there is no guideline for uh, organizations like ourselves to actually get established, um, you know, think about governance structures, think about the types of events that they want to Post, how do they get grant funding, all of that sort of stuff. We have all just done it sort of off um, advice from other people we know uh, and have just basically winged it. <laughs> um, so we have created this um, small group which um, now has about 10 member organisations. Uh, we meet bi-monthly and it's basically to provide advice on this actual topic. So if you are a person who's gone oh, um, I want to establish a bilateral or multilateral youth association, but I don't know how to, contact one of us uh, on the call. We are all in it. Um, and we will be able to connect you and guide you to um, basically establishing a new youth association um, in a correct way and as a legal entity in Australia. So feel free to connect if you have that idea. Um, but you're right, it is a very tricky um, kind of thing to start starting about. Um, otherwise, I would just say, you know, for everybody listening to this, please engage with whatever country you have an interest in. It is really critical that we maintain uh, connections with our overseas neighbours and to, you know, continue to build capability in being able to understand people who are from different countries to us. So um, please feel free to touch base with us all um, and attend our events and become members. <laughs> Um, that is an excellent answer and I think has um, <laughs> probably covered off on, on all the um, uh, advice um, that um, the other panellists um, might be able to provide. Um, but um, maybe we could go Deborah, oh. Kana and Cameron, did you have any final remarks um, that you wanted to, um, to say before we wrap up? 
Um, I think Clarice really yep. summed it all up nicely. So thanks so much for that, to Clarice. <laughs> but I would just say to anyone who's interested in getting involved, don't be afraid to put yourself out there. I think there's often a perception that as young people, we won't be listened to or taken seriously. And I've been really, really pleasantly surprised at how receptive people are to young people who are passionate about diplomacy and are passionate about international relations. I think if you're passionate, enthusiastic and engaged, that always comes across and people are always happy to help out when they see there's a good cause. Thanks, Deborah. Um, Cameron. Yeah, cheers. Um, I'll try and just spit out three quick tips. Um, first, understand the ecosystem you're working in. So if, for example, when we're putting together a modern slavery program, it makes no sense to just start it without having talked to the people that work in the space. So have conversations. Don't be too quick to start. Just have some informative conversations with the people involved in your bilateral relationship, government, civil society, etc. Secondly, you need to have a plan for how you're going to retain and invest in your volunteers. That is like the biggest challenge that these organizations have because you're doing it on the back of volunteers. So you need to have plans to make those people feel valued and to upskill those people. Thirdly, you need to have a really clear value proposition, both internally within your organization and externally. Don't try and do a hundred different things. I said, we did that. It was, we were all kind of burnt out at one point. So choose the things that you can do sustainably and really sell them. Um, if you're interested, you know, if you're watching this and you know, yeah, you, you want to learn more, just flick us a message. We, we are more than happy to chat. And if some, if the things that ASIP do really pique your interest, um, over the next year, we're really going to be doubling down on some thematic issues. So we're really focusing on a green recovery following the IPCC report that came out um, a few days ago. And we're really doubling down on our um, work on modern slavery and forced labor, as well as technology, digital trade and innovation. So any of those topics really speak to you. We're looking for you to partner with us. So come and talk to me. Excellent. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, Kana, did you have anything that you would like to wrap up? Sure. Um, I think um, our goal is to have a deep understanding and public awareness and also ongoing public discussion on regional issues. So it's great that young people are really passionate about um, those bilateral, multilateral area and try to do, drive the initiative and make them uh, voice heard. So I really appreciate, um, I really um, realize the lack of conversation in those issues, uh, even though I still work for the um, international area. So I really appreciate organization like Asia Society, uh, drive the initiative and stimulate the discussion on regional issues. So I, uh, AJYG would be love to be part of it along with the youth organization gathered today so we really encourage um young people audience today to check our activities and join our um, conversations excellent thank you so much um thank you to our panelists for a really insightful discussion um with that we're very nearly um, and very sadly, at the end of our public, nearly at the end of the public forum today, and it's been my absolute pleasure to be your moderator and to represent Young Australians in International Affairs in the process. I wanted to thank all of our attendees today for your questions and participation. Anything that we haven't had a chance to answer, we'll share with our speakers. Um, and the conversations we've had today will continue. At this point, I'd like to take the opportunity now to invite Philip Ivanov, Asia Society's Australia's Asia Society Australia's CEO to officially close today's proceedings and to highlight some next steps for Generation Asia. Thank you, Philip, and over to you. Well, thank you so much, Mercedes, for your um, expert moderation today. Um, and let me also first and foremost thank uh, Eloise Dolan for bringing us all together and for your passion and energy in driving our Generation Asia program. Um, what a forum this has been. Um, when we started working on this program, uh, our frame for convening it was that today, young Australians interested in the world face a unique combination of impossibilities. You know, international borders are closed, face-to-face -face interactions with global peers are limited, um, uh, governments and businesses are in risk management mode. Asian studies 
programs in our universities are in decline and inflow of international students to Australia effectively stopped. So we ask ourselves, are we in danger of losing a generation of Australians who may not choose to go to Asia to study, to work or to live, uh, which will diminish the pool of future Australian leaders who are engaged and familiar with the region at a time when we need all hands on deck to navigate a, a complex Asia. What seemed temporary last year is becoming a new normal in 2021 and computer and mobile phone screens are the only a bit vital windows to the world. Uh, but today our speakers uh, showed us a lot of optimism and hope, um, actually challenging this rather pessimistic proposition for this forum. They showed us that uh, engagement continues through digital platforms, through bilateral and multilateral initiatives, through government and policy programs through commerce and investment and cultural and research exchanges. But you also articulated a clear need to spotlight, to secure and to grow Australia-Asia programs uh, that prove to be working even in those difficult circumstances. And most importantly, your interest in Asia and your passion for the region is strong. So the, the Fortress Australia so far is a uh, is a physical construct, not a mindset. Um, we also uh, think, and you seem to agree, that Fortress Australia must reopen to Asia and the rest of the world as soon as it is safe to do so. So we do need a clear plan for the future of our globally connected economy that balances health security with our position as a global trading nation dependent on migration, on foreign investment, on education and talent mobility, which you will drive. Uh, and you as the next generation of leaders need to be involved in, in, in shaping that plan. So at Asia Society, we made the issue of generational Asia capability one of the four pillars of our new strategy. We believe it's in our mission to use the, our convenient power, our influence, whatever influence that we have, our global outlook to find ways to keep young Australians connected with the region. And we know that Asia society alone will not make a dent in this quite difficult national policy problem. And the solutions will come from young Australians like yourselves and through partnerships with like-minded organizations and through forums like this. So really my favorite part of the forum was you sharing the best practices on how you keep engaging with your peers, uh, with your countries of interest and with each other at this really difficult time. The, the personal connections and innovations that the pandemic and, and other conditions caused your organizations to innovate and to foster uh, are really important uh, indicators of our broader economic, political, diplomatic ties with the region. And, these initiatives, of course, and first and foremost, need to be funded and supported. So uh, we as an organization, and I personally call on leaders in business and universities and government to support and invest in your vital initiatives. Uh, we do need to amplify your missions and grow this community of young people that are interested in the region. So these are some of my takeaways from the forum, but of course, I'm still going to be uh, process them uh, in the uh, days and weeks ahead. Before we wrap up, I would like to take a moment to thank all our incredible speakers today. Uh, too many to list, but uh, what a privilege it has been to host and hear from such passionate young people from across Australia and the region. Special thanks to Ross Spence and Ridwan Jadwat, Amanda Rishworth, Dave Sharma, and of course, Jayathma Vikramanyaki for your contributions. Thank you to all of you who attended the forum. Uh, we enjoy connecting with you throughout the day. And please make sure to reach out to us and provide your feedback through the platform and the feedback tab uh, and directly to us so we can make our Generation Asia work more useful and impactful. At, at Asia Society, we're striving to be a convener of youth voices on and from Asia. Through our Generation Asia pillar, we're committed to spotlighting and mainstreaming younger perspectives through our research, through our advocacy and events like this. 
And we're also looking forward to establishing partnerships with Australia's Asia-focused youth organisations and dialogues, many of whom are represented today, and bring many of your executive teams to our GNA member network so that our work can be informed by you. Um, to do so, we, we're delighted to announce that we will be publishing three Generation Asia reports over the next 12 months, focusing on some of the issues and opportunities that you highlighted in this forum so we can share them with the policymakers, with business and university leadership and community at large. Um, we also invite you to stay engaged more broadly with our work. You can subscribe to our briefing monthly newsletter, follow us on social media, join our public events. Um, and finally, in November this year, we'll be bringing Asia Society's Asia Game Changer Awards down under. So what we describe as Melbourne Asia Game Changers Initiative will showcase uh, under-recognized and inspirational individuals who are making positive contribution to Asia and Australia's future in the region. So be sure to visit our website and our current projects tab on this platform uh, for more information and just to see how you can be involved. So thank you again to all our youth partners and supporting today's event and to the Victorian government and our members for making this forum possible. And most importantly, please stay safe, please stay well, keep strong and carry on. And we look forward to seeing you very soon. And our forum actually continues with an intercultural training session straight after me. So I will see you there.